we're going to talk about films. Let's do that. We spoke to Van Connor a little bit earlier on. Uh, he has been watching films for us this week so that we don't have to. This is what happened when I spoke to Van. Long time, Daryl. Did you think Oscar night was the last time we were in the same space? I know. Didn't, didn't that feel like a decade ago? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we spent a whole night celebrating a movie in which uh, everyone was confined within a single location while the rich people did whatever they wanted. I mean, it's almost like Bong Joon-ho predicted the future. <laughs> Quite. Um, we've got a couple of bits to get into, so uh, as usual, no cinemas, but um, some stuff coming out on digital release, I think, uh, at the end of this week. Starting with the Woody Allen film, Van, is that right? Yeah, so Woody Allen, and this has been called Woody Allen's final film. Now, I'm not sure how that works because there's a bit of backstory to this one. So, Woody Allen signed a deal with Amazon a few years ago to make four movies that this would form the basis of the end of his career. This would be how he closed out his career. The man's in his early 80s, fair play to him. Uh, Amazon uh, then gave him the money to go away and make the first of these four films, which he did. And then a little thing called Me Too happened. And it turns out that Woody Allen is minorly surrounded with, let's just say, ongoing controversy in that realm. Amazon then wound up in court with Woody Allen for the last two years. They eventually gave him the rights to this film back. He dropped his lawsuit and the film is now here for release. It's called A Rainy Day in New York. It has the usual bevy of all-star talent. Timothy Chalamet, Elle Fanning, Liev Schreiber, Diego Luna, Cherry Jones. Loads of names in there. It's the story of literally A Rainy Day in New York. A couple who go to New York together, they get separate by respective work assignments and they go through their own respective emotional journeys along the way that cause them to question what it is they want in life, what it is they want out of their relationship, the usual repertoire of Woody Allen questions. I've got a clip for you of Timothy Chalamet, well, hitting on Selena Gomez. There's no way around that one. Hey, you know what, Sam? Yeah. I'm going to get out here too. Ah. What are you doing now? Why? Uh, why? Because I got a little bit of time to kill and I uh, thought about going to the Modern Museum, look at the Ouija exhibit. Oh, I see. You got nothing better to do, so you want me to keep you company? You know what? Forget it. I dated your older sister. You always had a little bit of an attitude. Okay, I'm not looking for any trouble. I'm going to check out some paintings at the Met for fashion class if you want to keep me company. I don't know why you couldn't have just, uh... Fine. It'll be fun. We can get on each other's nerves. All right, let me change. I'm so... Are you hungry? I'd give you an Arizona lunch, but we're all out of beef jerky. Uh... Okay, just to h help me out with the timeline here, Van, because the accusations around Woody Allen have been around for a while. Uh, oh, for, yes. for the sort of the, uh, very much predate uh, Me Too anyway. So this film was... So Amazon commissioned him... And then when things started to intend, go on. The film was completed in 2018, and uh. this all surrounds uh, attempts by Woody Allen to have his book published, Ronan Farrow's book getting published, allegations from the 1992 case, as you say, it's been around for a while, allegations of that swirling up again, a swell of public outcry to cancel Woody Allen, how is it that he has been allowed to go on for all these years? And of course, that conversation has surrounded the film. Uh, numerous cast members have given their salaries back. They've given them over to charities. Uh, the actress Cherry Jones went to bat for Woody Allen. I did uh, Diane Keaton, who's not even in the film, but, you know, they've all given interviews and said, look, we've looked at the cases in our own specific ways. It's, you know, it's down to you to decide. It's not for us. But if we start making allegations based on democracy, it's a whole conversation for another time. But, say, that has surrounded this film and led to what has to be called the darkest cloud in some time for Woody Allen's career. And that's, you know, that's a career mired in allegations and controversies. Mm. Uh, so what, what was Amazon's stance on this? Amazon wants to pull out of the deal at the time with him in, 20, uh, in, in 2018, did they? Amazon declared the film unmarketable under the circumstances, mm. and he took them to court for breach of contract because, as he put it, this was based on a baseless 25-year-old allegation, and so he went to court. I think it was a $63 million lawsuit. He dropped it after everything was resolved and the rights were handed back. So the funny thing is, the film itself is imitating material at the side of all this. is a very inconsequential film. As far as Woody Allen films go, everything about this is boilerplate Woody Allen. It feels like one more go around the block for the man, that very specific Manhattan block that he occupies. And, uh, you know, it's got the same, it's got the usual typeface, that white typeface font that Woody Allen just uses on all his films now. It's got the usual dialogue, as you can hear from the clip, you know, uh, 
bizarre references to, you know, an, an Arizona lunch. Like, this is, okay, a weird bit of New York snobbery in there, but what do you expect for a Woody Allen film? I don't think there's much remarkable about the film, to be really honest. And after all the controversy, that, for me, is the biggest disappointment. Because I would rather it, the film had come out and it was one of those really, really good Woody Allen movies, like A Blue Jasmine or A Midnight in Paris. But what you get instead is very much a sort of dinner theatre with Woody Allen. It's, it's the same old, same old. It's, I'm not sure what number film this is, but it is interesting to note that, you know, we've had two years in a row now that are, you know, without a Woody Allen film. And we haven't had a year without a Woody Allen film since, I think, 1981. Wow. <laughs> really is the end of an era in that regard. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're going to carry on making movies, at least make good ones. Um, it, do, do Amazon have a point? I mean, are people going to shun this movie, do you think, on the basis of, um, of, of what they know? I personally, as far because obviously this is a question we've had a lot in the last few years, the cancel culture question. Now, as far as the cancel culture question goes, me personally, I would say, sure, don't make new films, because you're just asking the questions, but I don't think you should cancel the back catalogue. I don't think we should do to Woody Allen, for instance, what, we, what the WWE did to Hulk Hogan, or what HBO did to Louis C.K., which is simply to erase them from existence. Because I think that is disingenuous and I think that's also very discourteous to every single other person involved in the production of those works. Mm, that's the other point, isn't it, actually, is that a lot of very talented people have put... And I, I thought that when the Kevin Spacey situation kicked up and the, the film that he made that was released just around that time. Was it Was it, was <laughs> it, was it with a group of guys? What was that film called? Because Tar was it Taron Egerton Bill, was in it as well? Billionaire Boys Club with Taron Egerton and yeah. Ansel Elgort. So the best named cast you've ever heard. The film was terrible. <laughs> okay. It was absolutely terrible. And it was released in spite of them. They very knowingly released it because I think the distributor said, it was, a very, it was an independent label, specifically said, it, we believe the film is bigger. It will in no way affect the film. Spoiler alert, it did. No one's seen the film. And the few like myself who have can genuinely tell you it was rubbish. <laughs> okay, well, that's that. That's case closed on that one, that one then. <laughs> um, okay, I, I quite, I quite, I, I fancy uh, Rain Day in New York. I mean, I know you said it's not very remarkable, but uh, it sounds like at the moment I'm looking for sort of like sort of like easy, easy, ploddy, melancholy kind of films. Have you seen Midnight in Paris, though? No, I don't think I have actually. No, I would definitely recommend seeking out Midnight. That might be my, might be my favourite Woody Allen film of the past sort of 15, 20 years. Midnight in Paris, I like very much. It wasn't hugely well regarded. But I think it's got a lot going for it. Uh, Owen Wilson, and there's a time travel element. It's the 1920s, and Tom Hiddleston's in there, and it's all the sort of people who are hanging out in Paris in the 1920s. It's really, really good fun. But also, of course, Blue Jasmine, uh, which is absolutely astounding. Kate Blanchett, a lot of Oscar buzz around it. Great performance from Alec Baldwin in there and supporting as well. Worth checking out. So Blue Jasmine or Midnight in Paris, definitely go for either of those. Do you know, I saw on, on the issue of sort of melancholy, easygoing films, I watched uh, The Weatherman recently which is possibly the most melancholy, uh, easygoing, ploddy film I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> You've probably seen plenty of those, fam, but um, that just ticks all the boxes for me. Uh, Guest of Honour. It's a Guest of Honour, new film from Canadian director, and I'm going to try and get this right because I always mispronounce it. His name is Atom Egoyan. This is about a restaurant health inspector, played by David Thewlis. He's a Brit living in the US, uh, makes a living going around doing the, the health inspection in, in various restaurants. And they all seem to be the sort of uh, Turkish or Armenian kind of bent, a lot of kebab houses, things like that. He has a daughter who is serving time in prison for an incident involving an inappropriate relationship with one of her pupils, with a 15-year-old boy. He slowly starts to learn new information about the case, what actually happened, what's going on with his daughter, and it starts to you know, cause him to question his life and his role in her life and his decisions that he made in her upbringing, and he slowly starts to unravel as a result. I've got a clip for you of, of David he was just enjoying the high life of being the health inspector. Yes, I'm very impressed for a new establishment. So, uh, you got a good rating? Yeah, you've done a wonderful job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I just need to sign this certificate so you can put it in... What an intriguing premise. You know what? I, I, I sat down to watch this, and I, I, 
I wasn't immediately, I wasn't straight away gripped. I found myself thinking, it's a, you know, drama about a health inspector. How, <laughs> how good could this possibly be? I mean, I, I, it's one of those instances where, you know, going in knowing that basic remit did not prepare me in any way for the film. This is a startling drama. This really went in directions I didn't expect it to, but I think a lot hinges on that central performance from David Thewlis, who's always been a very interesting actor, has been for 20 something years now. And um, I think he's known to most people still, I think, as uh, Professor uh, Lupin in Harry Potter. He's the, the werewolf teacher in Harry Potter. But for this, I think he's absolutely tremendous in this. This is a real powerhouse performance. This has got some real thespian chops going for it. Um, great performance as well from, from a supporting cast that includes the likes of, of all people, Luke Wilson. Yeah, what kind, of, what kind of Luke Wilson do we get? What version of Luke Wilson do we get? We get quite a sincere, thoughtful Luke Wilson. Now, I've been forced yeah. to reevaluate my position on Luke Wilson recently. Uh because he's turned up in a new TV show called Stargirl, a DC comic series, which is basically like their version of Buffy, and he's playing the Giles character in it, and it's absolutely brilliant. And it's caused me to genuinely wonder, have I misjudged the Wilson brothers all these years? Because I know Owen's turning up in, in Loki this next year as well, so we've got that to look forward to. But yeah, we get we get Luke Wilson there, which is not a performance I expected from him. In terms of the sort of staging of this, this reminded me a lot of Thunder Road from last year, but I think this is a lot better. It has a lot more going for it. The story is very, very gripping. It's a little bit disjointed in that it diverts a good half of the runtime to the daughter and takes attention away. So you forget at one point that you are meant to be, you know, following the thrust of the narrative on the father because you get, you know, the daughter's story. But once it once it reconciles that imbalance, which is, you know, it's, it's still entertaining, it's still gripping, you know, even in those sections. But once it addresses that imbalance and refocuses back on Thulis for the third act, I think it's really something. I think it's a tremendous film. And there's really great support from an actor I have something of a trouble history with. Rossi of Sutherland is in there, who is uh, Kiefer Sutherland's younger brother, who I interviewed years ago. Ago. He wasn't in, let's just say, the best of states that day, and we wound up canning the interview. Um, <laughs> yeah. so we've, we've all been there, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, this was one of those. But he's he's got quite a good uh, a good role in there as uh, a relatively unlikable, very petty character, actually. And he, he pulls it off quite well. I was you know, also forced to reframe what I thought of him in that moment. Yes, I still don't like him. But now I'm meant to not like him, so it works. <laughs> I get always the best ones, the best interviews are the ones that don't go out, I find. Uh, <laughs> always the, the ones most li worth listening to. Um, okay, uh, looks really good, that. Um, looking forward to that film. Uh, guess, what's it, called, what's it called again? Guest of Honor? Guest um, of Honor. So that is on digital from Friday as well as uh, Ray Day New York. And our final film, which is Echo in the Canyons for this week. Great. Tell me about this. So Echo in the Canyons is a new documentary about the music scene in California in the 60s, specifically located in Laurel Canyon. And this involved a number of bands who just sort of moved out there and they formed a sort of commune together. You know, they had their separate houses and their mansions, but they also just hung out. They would, you know, knock on each other's doors in the the middle of the night whilst they were all on acid and like you know brian wilson would turn up at your door and be like hey check this out i just wrote this what do you think of this and he'd play you his new song and paul mccartney would do the same and you know and, and, and the birds and the mamas and the papas and this is what the whole scene was like i've got a clip for you of them literally sort of fleshing this idea out for you to be that close to the sunset strip and yet you had a feel that you were in the country it's beautiful It's like an open ticket to a studio, to a record, to everything. That's an incredible environment for a musician to be in. I fell in love with it. All the bands you think of is that California sound. Buffalo Springfield. My name is Neil Young. The Beach Boys. Hi, Brian Wilkins. The Mamas and Papas. The Birds. They were all there. This kind of thing could only happen in Laurel Canyon. Oh, nice, 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 nice. A lot of nostalgia in there as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's very, very steeped in that nostalgia. But you and I, of course, we, we've had many, many conversations about great music documentaries over the last few years, I think. We've reviewed our fair share of them. This is, as as is always the case, you know, it's a hell of a soundtrack. It's a good time for the fans. It's, you know, in the same way that we had when Supersonic was out, it's the same thing for Britpop and Oasis fans. Same kind of thing here. I would argue that you don't necessarily learn much more than that basic concept, which was, 
you know, we, we had this time where we all just lived in the same neighborhood and hung out and it was really cool and that's where all the pop music you love was born. I, yeah. Okay, that's, that's a great, great story for a movie. I'd love to see an actual fictional narrative where some random person moves into that neighborhood because that's a movie I want to see. Um, star, starring Owen Wilson. That would be really good actually. But, uh, you know, the, the soundtrack to this is really great. It focuses largely through the lens of Jacob Dylan, Bob Dylan's son, and, uh, Fiona Apple is in there as well. There's lots of, uh, contemporary musicians getting involved in sort of, uh, you know, exploring the music of the, of that time, uh, giving re recreations on stage. Uh, Beck gets involved, for instance. You get Fiona Apple and Jacob Dylan giving covers of Beach Boys songs and things like that. So I would say it's, it's definitely one for the nostalgia, as you say. And nothing particularly groundbreaking on the sort of documentary style. We're not talking about something in the realm of like Asif Kapadia giving you like, you know, something like an Amy or anything like that. Mm. Just nothing groundbreaking. But as far as a sort of, you know, you'd see it on VH1 for 90 minutes, two, two hours with adverts, and you'd really enjoy it, it's definitely a good time. Nice, good stuff. Echo and Canyon, love it. Van, a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much. Nice to chat again. Yeah, as always, good, sir. Until the next time. Frank Connor with us a little bit earlier on. Apologies again for the uh, slight crackle.